Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Hope and Passion Ministries. We are blessed to have you tune in. I'm Shelley Prindle, and you've tuned into our Revelation live stream series, and this is quite the message this morning. Mystery, Babylon the Great. My friends, how many of you have been sensing that there is something strange, something eerie going on in the world today? How many of you are sensing that something is shifting, something is happening? If you are, I'm here to tell you, you're not crazy. We are experiencing the shadows of this mystery, Babylon the Great. And I actually, as I'm saying that to you, I'm getting chills go down my back because the Holy Spirit is present because so many of you have never heard the word presented in such a way as we are going to connect Genesis to Revelation and make you understand by the power of God's Holy Spirit what is happening in the world. You see, this is no time to put your head in the sand. It's also not the time to go out and be shouting for different political parties and to be caught up in all the arguments. It's time to keep your eye on and feel the pulse of the supposed church of Jesus Christ and to connect what is happening in the culture today with what's happening in the church today with what God has already told us is going to happen at the end of time. Here we are, and it is clear that we are in the shadows of mystery Babylon the Great. I am blessed that you have tuned in. I'm praying that after you watch this live stream, when this recording gets to our YouTube channel, that you will share it with others that you will ask people to watch this who are interested, who are burdened, who are troubled, who are not understanding what's happening today in the world and why everything has gotten so out of line on so many levels. So we're going to get to that. As always, we ask you to pray about giving. God chooses to provide for ministries through people. He teaches you obedience he rewards your obedience for your giving and he teaches us as a ministry to be prayerful and depend upon him we are grateful for every donor i get down on my knees and i pray spiritual blessings over each and every donor you can give on venmo we're on the business section of venmo we are at hope and passion just search hope and passion ministries and of course our website is a place where you can always go and, and get in touch with us. You can give there. You can find my books there. You can get podcasts there. So hopeandpassion.org, or you can write to us right here in Irwin, Pennsylvania. We are grateful for all your giving. We only continue to do this because God provides through his people. So thank you so much for that. Now, I want you to get your Bibles out, if you would, with me, if you have them. Turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 17. And uh, as I shared with the technical department this morning, this message is a little different than usual because we just finished Revelation 16. And what we would normally do was when I begin preaching at Revelation 17, verse 1, I am going to read verses 1 through 5, but... The message is centered on Revelation 17, 5. And there's a reason for that. This information is so detailed and intensive. It's so broad. It's so much for many people to take in because churches, you know, in general, there are ministries and churches doing so, but in general, churches are not teaching end times prophecy in detail or comprehensively. So I felt that it was necessary to do an introduction message. That's why this is called Introduction to Mystery Babylon the Great. All right, so we're going to center our focus on verse 5. But if you have your Bibles, we're going to go ahead and begin reading at Revelation 17, verse 1. Then I'm going to explain to you where this chapter is, how it fits in to the flow of Revelation. All right, so here we go. Revelation 17, verse 1. 
Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality. And with the wine of whose sexual immorality, the dwellers on earth have become drunk. I got to tell you, I just have to pause there and say, we have an intoxicated world. And I don't just mean, I mean so much more than alcohol intoxication. We have an intoxicated church and an intoxicated world because of the idolatry that is sweeping over this nation and this world. And it begins in the churches. I just feel some preaching coming on to me. I'm telling you, this is a very serious message. Verse three, and he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and 10 horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Dear Father, we bow before you this morning. And I know that we are diving into deep, deep waters. A place where we need your Holy Spirit to break up the hardened ground a place where we need your Holy Spirit to give us a mind to understand and a perseverance to want to know. I understand the holiness of your word, the power of your word. And we know that you are moving and working in the world toward the end of time as we know it. We know that this world is in desperate straits. So many are hurting and so many are suffering under the shadows of mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and earth's abominations. But I thank you Lord God Almighty, that Jesus Christ is on the throne and that soon and very soon we will see the King of Kings and Lord of Lords descend from heaven and defeat every power that is against him. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that salvations would happen this morning that rededications would happen this morning, that this morning would be a wake up call. And I thank you for it in Jesus mighty name. Amen. I want to tell you, you know, when I was making the appeal to giving, do you know that hope and passion ministries, we got a donation this week from an entire church, a church gave out of their general account and said, we're sending a love gift to the ministry. And, and I believe I know why that is. I believe uh, the pastor, his wife, the congregation is benefiting from the teaching and instruction. We have several churches that support us financially out of their funds. And I want to tell you something. We will continue to stand and preach God's word. Come hell or high water. Because it must be told. All of the word of God must be presented. Including end times prophecy. Amen. So it, uh, the spirit of God is moving mightily to change people's lives. Hallelujah. Okay. Let's focus on revelation 17 verse five. I, I warned you, this is going to go broad here, but we've got to get an overview. 
this, this ominous verse that on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. Okay, now we're in Revelation chapter 17, and I'm giving you an introduction to this chapter before we dive in it real deep, okay? So chronologically, what you need to understand is that chapter 19 follows chapter 16. So if you're opening up your Bibles, you know, you say, oh, we just finished chapter 16. Chronologically speaking, what would follow next after that last trumpet would be Revelation chapter 19. So what we have is kind of like a parenthesis here. All right. We have a parenthesis. Chapter 17 and 18 give us a view of Antichrist empire, which is the direct target of judgments that we have just witnessed. We just finished watching the bowls of God's wrath, right? And Antichrist kingdom is the target of those things. And so I made this visual for you to understand when you're reading Revelation, you go from chapter 16 to 19 chronologically. In other words, you're going to move from the seven bowls of God's wrath, which we just finished. And as far as what will happen in the future, God will pour out the last bowl of his wrath and then will come the battle of Armageddon, which is found in Revelation 19. So we're experiencing here what we've seen other places in the book of Revelation, which is like a parenthesis, a pause, a parenthetical phrase, if you would. Okay, so chapters 17 and 18, again, are going to give us details of the Antichrist empire. And I share that with you because I don't want you to be confused as you're reading. So understand chapter 17, which we're going to give an overview of today and chapter 18 have to deal with details of the Antichrist empire and do not follow chronologically from chapter 16. That makes sense to everyone. Okay. So it's good to have an overview in mind. So chapter 17 that we're going to deal with today has to do with religious Babylon. Really in Revelation, there are two Babylons. I know there's a Babylon in Genesis as well, and I know there's a Babylon in the book of Daniel, right? But in Revelation, there are two Babylons. We have the religious Babylon, which is what we're gonna give an overview of today. And religious Babylon is really the apostate church. And the apostate church means the church that has gone into apostasy, that has turned away from the true faith, and walked straight into the big lie, the delusion, idolatry. All right, and then Revelation chapter 18 has to do with the commercial or political Babylon. So we got chapter 17 dealing with the spiritual mess that the world is already sailing into. And Revelation chapter 18 has to do with the political, economical, commercial mess that the world is already sailing into, that is part of this sweeping through of the Antichrist spirit. Now, don't get me wrong, the Antichrist proper, that, that pre-selected man that will be inhabited by Satan, he has not been revealed yet. The rapture of the church has not happened yet. We're not in the tribulation yet. But as I shared with you many times before, we are watching the shadows those things during the tribulation are so heavy and so huge that as God prepares the world for it, the shadows of those things are being cast even now into the world in which we live. And I think you can feel that happening. All right. Now, John Phillips, that, that great old Bible commentator, he was always so prolific with his words. Here's what he says regarding these two systems. He said, the Babylonian system is both religious and political. Now, the religious system paves the way for the political system. In the beginning, the religious system supports the political system. But in the end, the political system supplants the religious one. The religious system is symbolized in Revelation 17 as the Babylonian mother. The political system is symbolized as the Babylonian monster. I think that can make sense to you. Here's what's happening. Here's what's going to happen and we already see shadows of it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is being watered down. 
In the churches today, you can sit under the teaching of a pastor today and never hear Jesus' name emphasized as Savior from sin and soon coming King. Rather, you see the Bible presented as parables and stories and nice things to help us in our present life to be more successful, happier, have better families, larger kingdoms, whatever. It's, it's a bunch of psychotherapy babble. The gospel is being watered down. We were looking at uh, the vision of a church uh, and, and the church's vision statement and mission statement actually never once mentioned the name of Jesus, never once talked about sin or the need to be saved from sin. Not one time in a prominent, huge church so the gospel is being watered down. And what people don't realize is it is the church that is setting the stage for the Antichrist. Because it is the religious Babylonian system that will pave the way for Antichrist thinking. See, here's the deal in case you didn't get this, in case this doesn't make logical sense to you. Let me make it very clear. The Antichrist is just that. He stands in place of Christ. Or he tries to usurp Christ's power. He twists what is true of Christ into the lie. And so the spirit of the Antichrist has to start in the church because the church is the place where Christ is spoken of. And the spirit of the Antichrist is already swept through. Because as we begin to water down who Jesus Christ really is, as we begin to take away the power of the gospel... As we begin to see the, the truth, you know, people mention Jesus and Christ all the time, but they don't even really know who he is anymore. They use the name, but they don't know who it is. And that is exactly what the devil wants. Because the spirit of the Antichrist is against Christ. So if you water down Christ to the people, then when the Antichrist steps in and claims to be the savior of the world, the one that everybody can turn to, well, everybody's going to turn to him. Is anybody hearing me out there? You reject the true Christ, you'll accept a political leader in his place. Okay, John MacArthur, he said this concerning the overview here. Throughout history, Babylon has been an important center of false religion. In the end times, false religion will come back to where it started. The devil who deceived the people at Babel and from there launched false religion over the earth will deceive the world once again. The final world religion depicted as a harlot is the theme of this vision. And that is the prostitute that we're talking about. That is the mystery of Babylon. And it begins in the church. And John MacArthur ties it back to the book of Genesis, we're going to tie it back there as well. So we have to go back and we talk, have to talk about Babylon, uh, beginning with the Tower of Babel. Now I have a map up here for you, and I want you to notice here, here is Jerusalem, right over here in the current modern day land of Israel. This is Jerusalem. We've got the Mediterranean Sea. This is the Persian Gulf. Okay, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, those of you who are studying Genesis with me, you should have a real hand on that. This is the Mesopotamian Valley. All right, and here is Babylon, nestled somewhere there between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, Babylon. Now, I also want to share with you a modern day map so that you can have in your mind, if we look at this in modern terms, we've got the land of Iraq. Okay, the nation of Iraq, we've got Iran, Turkey, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, again, the Persian Gulf. In that modern day nation of Iraq, between, right, what, well, right up around uh, the Tigris River here is Baghdad. And then between the Euphrates and Tigris, right below Baghdad, we have the ruins of Babylon. Okay, so ancient Babylon and the modern day ruins of Babylon are found in the modern day land of Iraq. This is a picture, just a quick photo 
of the modern day ruins of Babylon. Now Saddam Hussein attempted to build, rebuild Babylon. I believe he thought himself to be uh, a reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar, but he wasn't completely successful, okay? Babylon still mainly lies in ruins. Now I'm gonna appeal to Paul McGuire and Troy Anderson. Paul McGuire and Troy Anderson. These guys um, wrote an incredible book called The Babylon Code, The Babylon Code, and I did read that uh, some years ago. And I wanna share the overview that they give of the Babylons, all right? So the Bible describing Babylon as the glory of kingdoms and the golden city actually tells the story of three different Babylons from Genesis to Revelation. The first one is Nimrod's Babylon, which is an archetype of the Antichrist end times empire. Nimrod, the first world ruler, is best known for building a great city and the fabled Tower of Babel. The second Babylon is the empire of King Nebuchadnezzar II. While mostly remembered for destroying the first temple and taking the Jews into captivity, the ruler of the Neo-Babylonian kingdom is also famed for living like a wild beast during seven years, get that, seven years, the tribulation lasts seven years, seven years of insanity in a foreshadow of the madness of the Antichrist. Last, Babylon reappears in the end times as mystery Babylon, an apostate worldwide religious system, and Babylon the Great, a corrupt worldwide geopolitical and economic system. Now, I know that's a lot of information, but what I want you to focus on is that when we think of Babylon biblically, there have been two Babylons and there's one to come. So the Bible speaks of three different Babylons, three different Babylons, beginning with Nimrod's Babylon. How many of you ever heard that name Nimrod before? When I begin to talk about these three different Babylons that the Bible speaks of, what I really want, uh, what I feel like the Holy Spirit wants to hit many of you is this. When you're talking about the book of Genesis to your children and to your grandchildren, Please do not read those stories as if they are just stories. Please understand that when you are reading the book of Genesis, you are reading what is the seedbed of the rest of God's revealed word. You are reading actual history. You see, if the devil can take the beginning from us, he can steal the end from us. If we believe that Noah's Ark was just a nice story to try to instruct us in being good, then we won't believe in the literal coming judgment. And if we don't believe that the Tower of Babel was an actual historical event, then we will not believe that the coming Antichrist system is. Although I don't know how you can live in the world today and not see the shadows of the Antichrist system. Nonetheless, the three Babylons of the Bible begin with Nimrod's Babylon. All right, we're going to start with Nimrod's Babylon. Then we're going to move to Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar that we find in the book of Daniel. And then finally, we are going to move to the Antichrist Babylon that is yet to come. That is both Mystery Babylon and Babylon the Great. All right, the Mystery Babylon and Babylon the Great, remember, Mystery Babylon, or the prostitute, is an apostate worldwide religious system, whereas the focus on the great part of it is the coming worldwide geopolitical and economic system. So we're talking about two different things. Mystery Babylon has to do with the religious arm of this, and Babylon the Great has to do with the political or commercial arm of Antichrist system. So let's do this. Let's begin with Nimrod's Babylon. Let's talk for a minute about the Tower of Babel. Now, first of all, Nimrod's name itself means we will rebel. <laughs> How about that? Any of you want to name your first child Nimrod? <laughs> Nimrod's name literally means we will rebel. 
And in the Bible, we find that names mean a lot, right? Remember that Jacob's given name was deceiver or liar. And when God got a hold of Jacob and wrestled with him, he changed his name to the Prince of Israel. So it's saying something that God reveals to us that Nimrod's name means we will rebel. Now, interestingly, Nimrod is the great grandson of Noah. This is incredible because Nimrod must not have looked back very far in history. He must not have learned a lesson from his great grandpa and how he stood strong and preached the gospel and remained faithful to God and the whole world got flooded. It didn't take long for evil to creep back into the world. Amen? Nimrod is the great grandson of Noah. Tower of Babel happened that quickly. I want you to know that the flood was not the final answer. It's the coming fire that Jesus Christ will bring that is the final answer. In Genesis 10:1, we read, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. So Noah had three sons. And then in verses six through eight, we read about the sons of Ham. And you follow that down through and you find out that Cush, one of the sons of Ham, fathered Nimrod. And he was the first on earth to be a mighty man. Now, we know that mighty there doesn't mean mighty for the Lord. I was just thinking this. You know, I ne I, this thought never crossed my mind until I was pacing right before I came on. I thought to myself, well, if you're talking about a mighty man for God, it have to be talking about Noah, preacher of righteousness for the Lord. Amen? So this can't be talking about a mighty man for the Lord. Nimrod was mighty. He might have been strong. He might have been a great hunter. But he wasn't mighty for the Lord. This is mighty in some other sense, all right? And we're going to talk about that. The Bible says he was a mighty man and a mighty hunter. In Genesis chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, the beginning of his kingdom was, look at the first place that was the beginning of his kingdom. What does it say? Babel in the land of Shinar. All right, first of all, when the Bible says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord and that the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, I like what the ESV, the English Standard Version Study Bible, says about that phrase, before the Lord. It says, these descriptions, one of which is linked with irony to the expression before the Lord, are probably to be viewed negatively. Nimrod's aggression as a person runs totally counter to what God had intended when at creation he commissioned humanity to be his vice regents or his representatives. God told Adam and Eve and all of humanity to be his representatives in the world, not to go out to oppress and crush people. You know, God put Adam and Eve in the garden and said, tend to it, take care of everything build explore and so we think that this phrase mighty hunter before the lord is to be viewed negatively i like how albert barnes also says it he says the expression before the lord intimates not merely that the lord was cognizant of what nimrod was doing because he knows all things but that nimrod himself made no secret of what he was doing of his own designs but he pursued them with a bold front and a high hand, and at the same time was aware of the name and will of Yahweh. In other words, he knew what God wanted him to do and be, but he boldly went out and rebelled anyway. His name, which literally means we shall rebel, is in keeping with the practice of an arbitrary and violent control over men's persons and property. Whatever Nimrod came to be through his might or his strength or his rebellion, he started to lord it over everyone. And to, to explore further what Nimrod did, I want us to turn to Genesis chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, get out Genesis chapter 11. But the first thing we're going to do is reread in Genesis chapter 1 what God told Adam and Eve to do. 
In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, which we call the cultural mandate from God. This was before sin ever entered the picture. God blessed Adam and Eve and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Spread out as it were. Spread out into all the earth that I have given you. Don't stay in one place, but go out and take charge of the entire world that I've given you. With that in mind, I'd like you to turn to Genesis chapter 11. And I want to read quickly here the narrative of what happened under Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. In exact opposition to what God said. God said, go out and be my representatives in the world. Fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis 11, beginning at verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they settled there. Okay? God told them not to settle in one place, but they did. And they said to one another, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. First of all, let us build a city. That's the political arm. And let us build, and the commercial arm, and let us build a tower with its top in the heavens. The tower is the religious arm. And when they say a tower in the heavens, that doesn't mean they literally thought they could build a tower as high as reaching God. They were worshiping the celestial heavens. This is like the beginning of astrology, if you will. They were taking the created order and worshiping that. Okay? And then the Bible says they did this. Here's what, they, here's what it says next. Let us build for ourselves a city and a tower and let us make a name for ourselves. Who are we supposed to be making a name for? Jesus. It's all about God. His is the only name to proclaim. Amen. But they said, no, we're going to make a name for ourselves. Lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. You see the rebellion? I mean, it's like they just might as well put their fist in God's face and try to smack him in the face. They said, we'll make a name for ourselves. Lest we be dispersed over the whole. What? That's exactly what God told you to do was to fill the earth and subdue it and to glorify him. But instead, they have this political commercial arm, the city, tower reaching to the heavens. They're worshiping false gods. And they're just saying, God, we're doing exactly opposite what you said. And I got to tell you something. When I look at the United States of America today, it's as if we're putting our fist in God's face and saying, we're going to do exactly opposite what you told us to do. Scary. Here we are. And I won't take time to read the rest, but you know the basics of how this goes. And if you, if you want a lot more detail on this, go back to my Genesis series. Uh, search on the YouTube channel where I, where I talk about the Tower of Babel. We spent weeks on this in the book of Genesis. You can get all the gory details there. But God came down and confused the languages. He dispersed the people. He said, no. You know why God said that? Because it wasn't time yet. It wasn't time yet for the Antichrist to rise up. Jesus hadn't even come and died on the cross yet. There was a whole plan of God to fulfill before God could allow the Antichrist to rise. First, he wanted Christ to rise, amen, so that you and I don't have to be a part of the Antichrist kingdom. Praise God for his plan. But I want to share something chilling with you. If you look at this picture up here, this is a painting of the Tower of Babel by Peter Bruegel. And he lived uh, in the 1500s. And this was just a painting that he made of the Tower of Babel. And notice that he depicts the Tower of Babel as unfinished, right? Because God stopped the people from their work and dispersed them. He confused their languages and sent them out from there. So Peter Bruegel's famous painting of the Tower of Babel leaves the tower unfinished. You want to see something chilling? And again, go back to our Genesis YouTube study to find details on this. But here's something very chilling. The next picture I'm going to show you. Now remember, this is the famed painting of the unfinished Tower of Babel, 
which was erected in complete rebellion against God in the spirit of the Antichrist. And now I'm going to show you a modern day photograph of the European Union's parliament building in Strasbourg, France. European Union. Remember, we've talked about the Antichrist is going to come from a Western confederacy, confederacy of nations or kings. Here is the European Union's parliament building in Strasbourg. Notice anything crazy? It looks a whole lot like this painting of the Tower of Babel with the unfinished top. Now, if you try to research this, the best I could find is, yeah, they left it unfinished because they want to show the dynamic and changing nature of the European Union, how it's yet to grow, something to that effect. But what I want you to notice is, my friends, this cannot be coincidence. I'm just going to leave it there because I wasn't there when this was built. I wasn't there to hear what the architects and the committee, what their intentions were. But I'm just going to leave it there with you. This is the famed Tower of Babel painting from the 1500s. And this is the European Union's parliament building today. Something to think about. Looking at these two maps here, you know, scholars try to estimate where they think the Tower of Babel might have taken place. Um, Answers in Genesis provides this map, and they think that the possible location of the Tower of Babel might have been up here, right between the Tigris and Euphrates, just across from the Mediterranean Sea, a little bit above Baghdad. Biblehistory.com places the plain of Shinar a little bit lower there more toward the Persian Gulf. But nonetheless, the Tower of Babel, the ancient Babylon was somewhere in that Mesopotamian Valley, the same place where we believe was the original Garden of Eden. And again, you watch the Middle East because God began the world in the Middle East. My friends, he's gonna end the world in the Middle East. Hallelujah, our God is a God of order. Now I'm going to quote for you John Walver, the great Bible scholar, as he was quoted in the Babylon Code that I referred to earlier. Here's a quote of John Walver. Yeah, you guys enjoying this? I hope I hope your spiritual antennae are up and you're thinking to yourselves, wow, this is a lot to understand, right? But that spirit of the Antichrist began in the book of Genesis. Okay, John Walver said, this is, again, go back and watch the Genesis series on this. Uh, on our YouTube channel for much more detail. But in a nutshell, the wife of Nimrod, who was the founder of Babylon, headed up the mystery religion which characterized Babylon. Okay, Nimrod might have been the political arm, but his wife seems to have been the religious arm. And she was given the name Semiramis. And according to the adherents' belief, she had a son conceived miraculously whose name was Tammuz. He was portrayed as a savior who fulfills the promise of deliverance given to Eve. This was, of course, a satanic description which permeates pagan religions. And you can do your own research on that, but Samiramis, Tammuz, that whole thing. We read about the queen of heaven in the book of Jeremiah, which is probably a reference back to Samiramis and this beginning of pagan religions at the Tower of Babel. There's so much here to be understood. But the bottom line for you is to remember the Antichrist spirit is nothing new under the sun. It began with Nimrod at the Tower of Babel. So we have much to learn from there as we look at the future Antichrist. Now Charles Swindoll said the plain of Shinar where Babel had been built eventually became the center of one of the world's earliest empires, Babylon. The religious pride of the Babylonians is well documented. Written Babylonian accounts of the building of the city of Babylon refer to its construction in heaven by the gods as a celestial city. The Babylonians took great pride in their building. They boasted of their city as not only impregnable, 
but also as the heavenly city, Babeli, which means the gate of God. That's where that word comes from, the gate of God. It's no wonder that Babylon, even after its collapse, as an influential political and religious center of the world, became a symbol for godless, humanistic religion in general. You can pretty much trace all the pagan religions of the world, all the idolatries of the world, back to the gate of the God. Back to humans without God, without Jesus, humans without the true God, trying to reach up and make their own gods. It all started from there. And then it continued on. We moved from Nimrod's Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. All right, that's the second major Babylon of the Bible. We have to talk for just a minute about King Nebuchadnezzar. You read of him in the book of Daniel. And again, don't read those just like stories. Those are actual historical accounts. And some things that you might recall about Nebuchadnezzar, and you might want to be reading through the book of Daniel this week. You might remember he had a dream. You might remember he erected a golden image. And hopefully you remember that he also went completely insane. Now, his dream is spoken of in Daniel 2, and I encourage you to read that this week, especially verses 31 through 45. I'm just going to give you an overview of it with this graphic that I'm going to use. God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream, and God allowed Daniel to interpret the dream. Now, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had was of a great statue, as you'll recall. And God was very specific when he gave Daniel the interpretation. He was very specific that the statue's head was of gold. And that that gold, of course, we know represents the Babylonian Empire. That represented Nebuchadnezzar's empire that he was over at the time of the dream. Then there was a silver arms and chest, which represents the Medo-Persian Empire, that would come after Babylon. Then the bronze thighs and middle, which represents the Greek empire that would come under Alexander the Great after the Persians. Then there were legs of iron, long legs, which would represent the Roman empire. And the Roman empire were the legs because in a sense, the Roman Empire is going to be revived under Antichrist. So this kingdom goes on long. So the iron represented the Roman Empire that would come in the New Testament times. And then God showed him the toes were made of both iron and clay. And my friends, those toes, those feet and toes represent the time, the shadows uh, of which we're living in right now. Antichrist kingdom. And then finally, God said, there will be a rock that is not formed by any human hand, but this rock will come rolling in. And this rock represents Jesus Christ. And one day in the future, that rock will come and it will hit that statue and it will shatter it to pieces. And that statue will effectively be blown to the wind. But this rock that rolls into it and destroys it will swell up into a mountain and will exist forever and ever. Any amens out there? All right, now again, I want to review with you. Here's what God told Nebuchadnezzar. He gave him a dream and he showed it to him. He said, Nebuchadnezzar, you've been blessed to be the head of gold. You're the Babylonian empire. But after you, there'll be another empire, not as great, but the Persian empire is going to come after you. But Nebuchadnezzar, clearly through this dream, there's going to be a third empire. And that will be the Greek empire, the bronze. And then will come the Roman empire. But on the heels of the Roman empire is going to come what is known as the revived Roman empire. The empire of the Antichrist, which will be a western confederacy of ten nations. That's why the ten toes but the toes are made of iron and clay. And as you read in the book of Daniel, you find that the iron and clay don't hold together. They don't mix. It's an artificial trying to put something together artificially that can't hold. And I'm here to tell you something today. 
The devil can try to put together whatever kind of political kingdom he wants. He can try to put together whatever kind of fake religion he wants. But in the end, the kingdom of the Antichrist cannot hold together. Praise God. And Jesus Christ is going to come rolling into the scene at the end of the tribulation, at the battle of Armageddon. He's going to come rolling into this whole thing. And every nation... You know, there's a bit of Babylon in Persia. There's a bit of Persia in Greece. So therefore, by the time you get to the Antichrist, there's a bit of every wicked empire that tried to take Christ's place in it. But Jesus comes rolling in. Hallelujah. And he destroys the whole thing. And it becomes his kingdom becomes a mountain that will never, ever end. That's some preaching there. Do you know what I want you to understand? God told Nebuchadnezzar way back in the 6th century BC, God made it clear to both Nebuchadnezzar, to Daniel, and to everyone that would listen. You know what Nebuchadnezzar did? He did what so many of us do. God said, I've blessed you, king, to be over the world right now, but you're just a human being. Your kingdom has an end. It ends at the head. Then other kingdoms will come. And ultimately my kingdom will come. But that wasn't good enough for Nebuchadnezzar. You know? Isn't that the root sin of everything? Pride. God says, listen, I've given you opportunity. He says to each one of us, I've given you life. I've given you opportunity. I've given you time. I've given you money. I've given you abilities. And you're supposed to use it for me, not for yourself. It isn't about you. It isn't about your pride. It isn't about you continuing on. It's about the kingdom of God continuing on through you. Amen. But Nebuchadnezzar did what we do. And after seeing clearly what God's plan was in the very next chapter, okay, chapter two, he's given the vision. Chapter three, Nebuchadnezzar says, oh, God. You're telling me that I'm just the head and that my kingdom has an end and that it's really about you and what you're doing in the world? Hmm. Well, I'll fix that. You know, I'm just the head of gold. And guess what Nebuchadnezzar did? He set up a statue, probably of himself, and in direct defiance of what God had just showed him, he made not just the head of gold, but the whole thing of gold. The whole thing he made of gold. 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide was this incredible image that he set up on the plain of Dura. You know how it goes. He set up that image and he demanded that Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and all. I, I love in the reading of the scriptures today, he commanded that all peoples... And it was interesting, as I heard the reading happening this morning, you know, it hit me. He commanded the magistrates, the satraps, the prefects, the judges, the counselors. He took every political arm, the executive branches, the judicial branches, the legislative branches, as it were, of all nations, and said, when you hear the music, bow down and worship the image. Listen to me. The shadows are happening even now. Antichrist is not content to have just people who are deceived by false religion to bow down and worship. But we are now seeing government officials, people who should be standing in righteously as they can for God's sake in the judicial systems, the legislative branches, the executive branches, economic leaders. We're seeing everybody begin to bow down to the antichrist spirit. You remember how this went? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood alone. 
Even though Nebuchadnezzar said, you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace, you're going to die. Of course, we know God protected them. But this is an eerie foreshadowing. Okay? It all started in Babylon at the Tower of Babel, moved to Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. But this is all a foreshadowing of a day coming that we've been talking about for months and months and months. When in the middle of the seven-year tribulation, Antichrist breaks his peace treaty with Israel, sets up an image of himself in the temple in Jerusalem. This is literally going to happen. This literally happened. That is literally going to happen. And he will demand at point of death that you either worship the image and take the mark of the beast or you die. And many will choose to die in faithfulness to Christ when that day comes. Now God will effectively save them as he did Shadrach. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't have to physically die. They did have to go into the furnace. But of course, if we die for the name of Jesus as untold numbers of missionaries and many people have for the sake of Christ, we know we go immediately into the presence of God. But this is a foreshadowing of what's to come with the Antichrist. And so I want to point this out because it just goes from Daniel 2 to 3 to 4. Then in chapter 4, what happens after you put yourself as the center of the universe? What happens after you decide, instead of my life worshiping God, I would rather have people worship me? What happens when you get that spirit of the Antichrist in you? Every time, insanity. Insanity not only for you, because it is an actual... I didn't plan on saying this, but it's a little extra psychological help inserted in. Every time you choose yourself over God, that is a break in sanity. Because you were rigged, you were built, you were designed to worship Almighty God. So when you choose to put yourself on the throne, expect things to go crazy. Expect your sanity to begin to be pulled from you until you find that restoration in Christ. Till you find that forgiveness and that ability to overcome self-worship. Amen? God warned Nebuchadnezzar that he was going to literally go insane for his pride. Because even after all of this, he would not heed the voice of God. And we're only going to go a few more minutes, so stick with me on this. You don't, you don't want to miss this ending. So in Daniel chapter 4, the very next chapter, I want to read uh, verses 28 to 33, because this just deserves to be read. So God continually warned Nebuchadnezzar, made it clear who he was, who Nebuchadnezzar should be. Nebuchadnezzar just always gave the credit to himself. He always wanted worship. So in verse 28, all this came upon Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power? After everything God had shown him. After God showed him that he saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Nebuchadnezzar with a lying tongue said, Oh, I'm going to trust in the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Still, after all of his faking, after all of his lying, after all of his pride, after all the warnings God gave him, still, he walked out in his royal palace and said, Look at Babylon that I have built. Not God, me. This isn't something God gave to me. This is mine. I'm God, in essence. And now listen to what happened. While the words were still in the king's mouth. Now God had told him that was, this was going to happen. And it did. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. And you shall be driven from among men. And your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You're not going to live with people anymore. You're going to live with animals. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time, seven years will pass over you until you finally know that it is the most high that rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will. 
that you are just a tool of God and not God himself. And guess what? Immediately the word was fulfilled. He was driven from among men. He ate grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagles feathers and his nails were like birds claws. And here is an artist's rendition. And this is true of what happened in Nebuchadnezzar for seven years. The man went insane. He lived like he was an animal. His physical self became animalistic like claws and feathers. And he crawled. We don't know what went through his mind during that time, but it was a time of insanity. And I'm giving a warning to you right now. Uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons never to say this. Can anybody get saved during the tribulation? You're already in trouble if you're asking that question for yourself. If you're saying, can I be saved during the tribulation? You're already in trouble. Because you're already understanding what the tribulation is to some degree. You already know that you should be right with God to some degree, you have some level of knowledge that you're obviously putting off and rejecting. So you're already putting your soul in spiritual peril by hardening your heart. If you're asking it on behalf of the unsaved, okay, I understand that. But I want you to share something with the unsaved. I want people to understand something. The time of the Antichrist is going to be animalistic. That's why his name in the Bible is the beast. It's, we, we're living in it now. Why do you think it's been in the 1900s? Like, why do you think it's been in modern times that creationism has been ousted out of schools and that public schools now teach evolution? Because the Antichrist spirit is, is just that, the spirit of a beast. We now teach kids that they descend from animals. We don't teach them that they come from the hand of Almighty God, divinely made. We teach them that they've descended and evolved from animals. And guess what? They live like them. The ultimate outcome of a godless worldview is living like an animal. By mere instinct, without rationality, without love. Here we are. Tower of Babel, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. These are all foreshadowings of what's to come. So you better hold on to your seats, folks. And you better be right with Jesus Christ. And you better understand where you're at with the Lord and what you're listening to. Because mystery Babylon and Babylon the Great is the next Babylon and the final Babylon Praise God, who's thankful it's the final Babylon ever to be revealed. Okay, let's close this up now. Let's go back to verse 5. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and earth's abominations. Again, the Bible says this is a name of mystery. This is very deep. This is very mysterious. And yet God shows us what we need to know. Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and earth's abominations. Here's a quote that I put down in my notes. I feel so strongly about this. I want you to let this sink in. I'm going to close with one, with one more quote in just a minute. Listen to me. As we have seen with Nimrod's Tower of Babel, and Nebuchadnezzar's golden image, spiritual deception and rebellion leads to political chaos and tyranny. It was Nimrod's heart of rebellion, the people's heart of rebellion to say, we know what you told us to do, God, and proof is, you know, were they innocent? They might not have known what God wanted. No, they said, let us build a tower and make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed. They knew what God wanted them to do, and they rebelled against God. And it was rebelling against God that led to all the other fallout. Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, okay? 
it began with pride and spiritual rebellion against the clear revelation of God, what was happening then and what was to happen in the future, who God was versus who humanity was. And all of that spiritual deception and rebellion led to the erection of an image and the forced political and economical, right, bowing, if you will. It always starts with spiritual deception and rebellion. That's why Babylon of the end times will begin with the harlot or the prostitute or the false church, the watered down gospel. Once the people are spiritually deceived, it becomes so easy for political chaos and tyranny to set in. And I don't believe I have to say much more than that for you to understand what I'm talking about. We are in it today. We are in it today. We are careening toward that time. We are in the shadows. The root of all cultural evil is a weak and deceived church. And I actually get tears in my eyes. It breaks my heart when I see Christians railing at the unsaved. When I see Christians tearing apart the unsaved and, 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 and all that they're doing and, and, and all that's happening in the world. When I get, when I see that those same Christians don't understand, it's our fault. If you're sitting in a church or under a ministry or reading Christian books or thinking that you're doing the Christian thing when you're in a church that isn't talking about Jesus Christ and his blood shed for sin. And that he is the only way you can be set free from bondage to sin and shame. When you aren't upholding the word of God, preaching the whole counsel of God's word. Making people understand from beginning to end how all this fits together. Then you're a part of the problem. Church isn't for feeling good. Church isn't for drinking lattes. You can go drink lattes somewhere else. Church isn't for hype. It's not for emotionalism. Church is for Jesus. It's for people to come to Christ. It's for dirty, rotten sinners like me and like you to find freedom from sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. Church is not a place for people to just get the bare minimum. Church is a place for you to learn the word of God inside out through and through. And the world can handle it. They want it. They're starving. Everything that's happening in America today is because of a weak and deceived church. You're going to see that in these coming weeks. The prostitute... The whore of Babylon rides on the beast. And then the beast turns around and devours the prostitute. The false church rides on Antichrist system. And then the Antichrist system eats up the false church and says, now you'll worship me. Whew. Let's end with Warren Wearsby. Warren Wearsby, just want to end with this quote. You ready? One reason the Apostle John used symbolism concerning the beast, the prostitute, was so that his message would encourage believers in any period of church history. Hallelujah. The true church is a pure virgin. Revelation 19, 7 and 8, you can read about it. Maybe I should turn there since I'm over time anyway. Is anybody still watching? Is anybody still watching? I'm just going to read this anyway. Revelation 19, 7 and 8. You ready? Let us rejoice and exalt and give God glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Hallelujah. The marriage of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, her, his bride has made herself ready. We are to be the bride of Christ. The true church is a pure virgin. But the false religious system is a harlot who has abandoned the truth and prostituted herself for personal gain. In every age, there has been a harlot 
who has persecuted God's people. And this will culminate in the last days in a worldwide apostate religious system. I never thought I'd see the day when supposed Christians persecute other Christians. When Christians mock Christians for talking about Jesus and his blood. We're in trouble, folks. And he ends by saying this. Likewise, every age has featured a Babylon. A political and economic system that has sought to control people's minds and destinies. Just as the contrast to the harlot is the pure bride, so the contrast to Babylon is the city of God. The new Jerusalem. The eternal home prepared for the Lamb's wife. Each generation of believers has to keep itself pure from the pollution of both the harlot and Babylon. The true church is to be a virgin pledged only to Jesus. The false church full of idolatry and self-worship. The true kingdom, the true city, is the new Jerusalem that's going to come down out of heaven from God. The false city, the false political system, is that of the Antichrist, whose shadows are even now upon us. I don't think I have to say too much more, but I do want to pray. And I'm asking you, if you've learned something, if you've been duly warned, if your spiritual antenna are up, Share this message. Listen to it again. Study these scriptures. Get it in your mind. The broad scope of what's happening from God's perspective. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the hearts that are attentive and desirous to learn your word. I now pray for those who are lost in sin to to call upon Jesus with all sincerity and to ask him to forgive them, to wash them clean by his blood, to set them free, to live for God and not self. And for those of us who are Christians, empower us, convict us, strengthen us, and let us never be deceived. But may we be on the front lines for the truth of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. I wanna invite you, don't forget Tuesday night, the unpardonable sin and the rapture of Lot, and then I'll see you next Sunday morning. God bless.